Hey you guys, this is Mr. Mellings and today we're going to be talking about the development of modern atomic theory, the evolution of modern atomic theory. So it all starts with this guy right here, 2,000 years ago, with this Greek philosopher by the name of Democritus. Back in the day, 2,000 years ago, there wasn't Xbox, there wasn't PlayStation, there wasn't Twitter, there wasn't Instagram, there wasn't Facebook, there was not Call of Duty Black Ops. So what did these Greek philosophers do back in the day? Well, they thought about things. And one day Democritus is thinking 2,000 years ago, what is all this stuff around me made up of? And he comes up with this idea right here. He formulates the very first atomic theory. He says that all matter is made up of tiny little particles called atoms. He says these atoms are indivisible. They're indestructible. He also says that these atoms are always in motion, and between these atoms there is empty space. And last but not least, Democritus says that there's an infinite number of atoms and kinds of atoms which differ in shape and size. So 2,000 years ago, there wasn't the technology that there is today, and not a bad little uh, theory for Democritus to come up with. So let's fast forward now 2,000 years and talk about John Dalton and his atomic theory. So 2,000 years go by and technology evolves and then this guy comes along, John Dalton, in 1808. He publishes a paper where he talks about uh, his atomic theory, that is to say his theory of atoms. And in 1808, he comes out with his atomic theory and he states that, yes, just like Democritus, all matter is made up of tiny little particles called atoms. Furthermore, he states that atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties. And today we know this not to be true because of something called isotopes. And we talked about isotopes in a different video. You can go ahead and click that little card in the top right hand corner that just popped up. And that will take you to the video on isotopes. All right, thirdly, John Dalton's modern atomic theory in 1808 stated that atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. Today we know this is not true. In fact, we proved this in 1945 over Hiroshima and Nagasaki when we dropped two atomic bombs on those two cities in Japan. Okay, so atoms can be subdivided. In fact, we can also synthesize these in labs today as well. All right, but back in 1808, this was John Dalton's, one of John Dalton's little postulates of the time. Fourthly, he states that atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form chemical compounds. What does this mean? Well, if I were to ask what is the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen in water, it's 2 to 1. There are two hydrogens for every one oxygen. It is not H2.3 to O1.5. They come in whole numbers, H2O. The ratio is 2 to 1. And so, yes, we know this to be true today as well. And fifth and finally... John Dalton states that in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, or rearranged, and today we know this to be true today. So if we take a look at John Dalton's model of the atom in 1808, it might look something like this right here, a solid, indestructible little sphere of matter. There weren't any protons or neutrons or electrons in John Dalton's model of the atom. There wasn't an elect uh, electron cloud or any, any energy levels because those things had not been discovered yet. So after 1808 and John Dalton's modern atomic theory, other scientists start to develop on his work and uh, subatomic particles and energy levels and all that good stuff start to be discovered. So let's fast forward about 90 years and start talking about J.J. Thompson. Okay, so fast forward about 90 years or so, and J.J. Thompson comes along. Who is J.J. Thompson, and why is he important? Well, J.J. Thompson is an English physicist that lived between 1856 and 1940, and he wins the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1906 for his discovery of the electron. All right, so J.J. Thompson discovers the very first subatomic particle, the electron, in 1897. However, in 1897, they're not called electrons, they're called corpuscles. It's not until about 1921 or so that another scientist decides to go ahead and name them electrons. But for all intents and purposes, J.J. Thompson discovers the very first electron, and as a result, he's awarded the Nobel Prize in 1906 in the field of physics. Okay. Also, J.J. Thompson is important because he found the very first evidence of isotopes existence. All right, a very important concept that we talked about in an earlier video. And last but not least, right here, it states that J.J. Thompson suggests that electrons were about a thousand times smaller than atoms. So how did he discover the electron? Well, 
he discovers the electron using cathode ray tubes or Crookes tubes at the time is what they were called and that led to his development of the model of the atom which is referred to as the plum pudding model of the atom so let's take a look now at J.J. Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment and the plum pudding model of the atom so J.J. Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment basically looks like this right here back in the late 1800s what he does is he uses one of these little things called a Crookes tube which essentially is the same thing as a cathode ray tube and here's how it works inside of this glass tube there's a partial vacuum we have two magnets right here and right here furthermore there's a little electrode right here that we can hook electricity up to and when we hook electricity up to this we see that what ends up happening is there's a little blue beam down here that travels this way travels through this little slit in these magnets here and that causes this this little beam to get uh, uh, to get diffracted in different angles onto the end of this little tube right here and so what J.J. Thompson surmises is that what we're seeing right here is a flow of what he referred to as corpuscles or later called electrons and that these tiny little electrons do in fact have a mass they have a mass and they're an actual little particle and so what he does from this little experiment is he comes up with uh, the plum pudding model of the atom. So let's go ahead and take a look at that right now. So after J.J. Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment, he develops what is known as the plum pudding model of the atom. And he basically states that an atom is going to look like this. That an atom is nothing more than this positive goo. And in this positive goo, there's this... Uh, there are a bunch of these tiny itty bitty little negative particles called electrons that are dispersed randomly throughout this negative goo. All right, so this is the plum pudding model, and you can think of the plum pudding model kind of like a uh, a blueberry muffin, where the blueberry uh, the blueberries are the negative electrons, uh, and the muffin part is the positive goo that those negative little electrons or blueberries are dispersed randomly throughout. Okay, so this is the plum pudding model of the atom this is jj thompson's model of the atom and this stood for several years until another scientist came along and developed on this idea of uh, the plum pudding model so let's now talk about ernest rutherford okay so who is ernest rutherford and why is he important well it says right here that ernest rutherford was a new zealand born british scientist he wins the nobel prize in physics in 1908 for his discovery of the nucleus and later on the protons that are inside of that nucleus okay so he wins the nobel prize in 1908 and he is known as the father of nuclear physics okay and his famous experiment is known as the gold foil experiment and we're going to take a look at that right now and his model of the atom that we'll talk about momentarily is referred to as the planetary model of the atom so Ernest Rutherford is important because he discovers the nucleus of an atom he discovers the protons are located inside of that nucleus he also states that the atom consists mostly of empty space with all its positive charge concentrated in the center in a very tiny volume surrounded by a cloud of electrons so now let's take a look at Ernest Rutherford's gold foil experiment that led to the discovery of the nucleus of the atom and protons okay so ernest rutherford has two guys working underneath him he has hans geiger and ernest marsden and what they do is they build this little thing right here called the geiger marsden apparatus and here's how it works we have a little chamber in the geiger marsden apparatus that has this little thin sheet of a uh, gold foil right and what these guys do is they beam alpha particles down this little tube right here into this uh this gold foil right here and so they theorize that hey uh, if this jj thompson's model of the atom is correct then these alpha particles are just going to pass right through no problem right however what they find in this little experiment in the gold foil experiment is that when they beam these alpha particles this way towards a bunch of little gold atoms some of them pass right through these little gold atoms but some of them get deflected at different angles right some of them are getting deflected this way some of these little alpha particles are being deflected at this angle right here so what they surmise and theorize is that at the center of every single atom is a super 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 tiny super dense material 
known as the nucleus of the atom. And that inside of this atom, there are tiny little particles called protons that have a positive charge. Okay, so the Ernest Rutherford gold foil experiment is the experiment that led to the discovery of the nucleus of atoms and later on the protons that are in the nucleus of those atoms. So now let's talk about Niels Bohr and the Bohr model of the atom. Several years go by and Niels Bohr comes along. Niels Bohr was a Danish physicist. He wins the Nobel Prize in 1922 for uh the Bohr model of the atom. And what Niels Bohr basically states is that electrons move around the nucleus of an atom in a circular, a circular motion and that those electrons are in fixed positions. Furthermore, what he states is that these electrons that are in these different energy levels orbiting the nucleus or circling the nucleus can jump into different energy levels. All right, so here is an example of the Bohr model of the atom. Let's take a closer look at what he's talking about. So in the Bohr model of the atom, here's what's happening. So if we take a look, Bohr states that, yeah, at the center of every single atom, there's a super dense, super tiny little uh, substance called the nucleus. And then outside of the nucleus, you have these fixed orbits that these electrons are circling the nucleus in. And that these electrons cannot exist between these different little orbits. Instead, they exist in this orbit here or this orbit here or this orbit here. Okay, furthermore, he states that these little electrons can jump up into higher energy levels and they can jump back down into lower energy levels, releasing energy along the way. So if we take a look right here, we have a ground state. Uh, well, let's go back here. Let's wait for this to come back. We have a ground state atom right here with the electron in the lower energy level. It's going to absorb energy and bam, it's going to move to a higher energy level. And this little electron can jump back down into a lower energy level by releasing energy along the way. So this is the Bohr model of the atom and the energy that can be released from the electrons jumping back down into a lower energy level come in the form of light and understand the concept that red photons have low energy and violet photons have high energy and that we can measure the amount of energy that is being released right here using the formula E equals H times F right E equals Planck's constant times the frequency of that little photon and we learned about that in an earlier video as well okay so that's the Bohr model of the atom let's now continue our evolution of modern atomic theory and talk about a guy by the name of Louis de Broglier, a French physicist from the early part of the 1900s. So who is Louis de Broglier and why is he important? Well it says right here that Louis de Broglier was a French physicist who made groundbreaking contributions to quantum theory. In his 1924 PhD thesis he postulates the wave nature of electrons and suggests that all matter has wave properties. So check this out. Louis de Broglie wins the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1929. Why? Because he discovers that electrons have wave-like properties just like protons and furthermore he comes up with this equation right here where he postulates that all matter in fact exists or I'm sorry exhibits wave-like properties. So he wins the Nobel Prize in 1929 for his little contribution to modern atomic theory. Let's continue on now and talk about Heisenberg and Schrodinger and the wave mechanical model of the atom, which is our current understanding of the model of the atom today. So as several years go by and these two guys come along, we have Werner Carl Heisenberg who wins the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1932 and Erwin Schrodinger, an Austrian physicist who wins the Nobel Prize in 1933. So what are their contributions to modern atomic theory? Well, Heisenberg, not this Heisenberg right here from Breaking Bad, this is a different Heisenberg. However, you can see the resemblance in his character to the real Heisenberg right here. So who is Werner Carl Heisenberg and what is his contribution to modern atomic theory? Well, Heisenberg basically comes up with this idea called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle that states that you cannot pinpoint the exact location of an electron outside of the nucleus of an atom. Instead, you can only come up with a probability for where it might be. So this is known as the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And then you have this guy right here, Erwin Schrodinger. He wins the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1933. He's the guy who comes up with the idea and thought experiment 
we know as the Schrodinger cat. We can talk about that in a later video. But he comes up with this little thing right here called the Schrodinger wave equation. And he builds upon de Broglie's theory that electrons exhibit wave-like patterns. And it's this equation right here that leads to his winning of the Nobel Prize in Physics and our continued understanding of the atom today. Okay, So the wave mechanical model of the atom is our current understanding of the model of the atom today brought to you by Heisenberg and Erwin Schrodinger. So let's take a look at the wave mechanical model of the atom. So what we're looking at right here is an image of the wave mechanical model of the atom. So at the center of each of these little boxes there's a nucleus and the bright spots in this, these little boxes here they represent the highest probability for where those electrons are gonna be. Okay, So no longer do we just have little electrons orbiting the nucleus like planets around the sun like you drew in third grade and in fourth grade however now we have a complete understanding of the model of the atom and that is the wave mechanical model that we cannot pinpoint the exact location of an electron surrounding the nucleus instead we can come up with a a mathematical equation that will help us determine the highest probability for where those little atoms are going to be. So the wave mechanical model once again is our current understanding of the atom today. So let's take a brief glimpse into the evolution of uh, the atomic models over time. So what we're looking at here is the evolution of modern atomic theory. We have J.J. Thompson's model of the atom, the plum pudding model in in summary, if we take a look at it here, if there is no nucleus, there are no protons, there are no neutrons, and so here is the plum pudding model. Then we have Rutherford's planetary model, where at the center there is a super tiny, super dense nucleus that's filled with little protons, and outside of the nucleus we have these little electrons that are just orbiting the nucleus like planets around the sun. Then we have the Bohr model of the atom that states that these electrons right here are circling in fixed paths that these electrons don't exist between the different energy levels and that these electrons can jump to higher energy levels and back down to lower energy levels and emit energy in the form of light along the way and last but not least we have today's model of the atom the heisenberg schrodinger wave mechanical model of the atom where basically an atom is like what you see right here at the center is the nucleus of this little atom and then there's like a firefly dancing around the nucleus of this little atom. It's here, and it's here, and it's here, and it's all over the place. So that is modern atomic theory in a nutshell. If you like what you see, go ahead and click the little bomb in the bottom right-hand corner, and that will subscribe you to my channel. And feel free to leave any comments or questions in the comment section down below. And I hope you guys found this helpful.